he would just kind of shut down a little bit and maybe throw out some cliches or just let you know that he didn't really want to talk too much. The The interesting part of him opening up is him talking about um, you know struggles with migraines, which everyone knew that he had while he was here, but also anxiety. And I th- I thought it was really interesting to to hear him talk about that, um, you know, saying in, in this article that uh, he, he felt like he was kind of having an out-of-body experience at times because he was so anxious. Um, you know, I'll just quote from, from the article, uh, I think it was Sports Illustrated article, my heart would be going, I'd be sweating, I felt like everybody in the room was looking at me, my speech was slurring, I didn't want to eat, I was gasping for air, you're so worked up that it's hard to spit words out. And when you look at Harvin, I th- there were times where you would see him at his locker and he looked like he was struggling. And the assumption on my part was always could be dealing with migraines again. Um, but, you know, I, I'm really encouraged by basically society in general and how they've opened up and talked about mental health issues, anxiety, depression, all of those sorts of things. And and so I, I was glad to see that a guy like Harvin, who hasn't opened up in the past much about that, was able to to come out and, and talk about it. So, um, you know, so many people look at football players as these robots, these machines, and not, you know, real human beings that are dealing with some issues that, that others in society are. And so uh, I like that he put, uh, you know, a bit of a, a personality and and some context around who he is and what he's dealt with. You know, unfortunately it came after his career and, you know, a lot of people aren't going to, you know, or didn't really understand a lot of what he was going through while he was here, while he was with the Seahawks. Um, you know, and you look at that outburst that he had on the sidelines with Leslie Frazier, he addressed that. Um, so I, I just like the fact that you know, people are opening up and feeling more comfortable talking about things that, uh, you know, what probably wouldn't have been talked about as much even five years ago. No, I think that's very true. And I think we've all started to realize just, I mean, what's the percentage of people, just Americans who have, who deal with something that could be categorized as a mental health issue? Yeah. I mean, whether it's anxiety, whether, and then you add in concussions, physical pain, pressure and everything else. You know, I, I know, you know, I was an aggressive beat writer when I covered the Vikings and when you're an aggressive beat writer, you butt heads with people. And, you know, as an, obviously as an opinion columnist, I'm going to tick people off all the time because that's the way it works. But I look back at my years covering the NFL as a beat writer and I just, it's like, okay, this player was a jerk when I dealt with him. Right. And I look back and say, well, that guy probably had nasty concussions. He probably was in physical pain and who knows, he might have had some kind of mental health issue, whether it's anxiety or something related to the concussions or something else. You know, it's like so many of them, uh, you were around them when they were playing and you just, there was a lot of anger there on their part, whether it's yep. directed at me or somebody else. And then they get past their playing career. And if they're healthy, they're different human beings. Yeah. I mean, we've, <laughs> we've each seen that a lot yeah. with, with players. And the other thing that you don't know, too, is how much pressure is being applied um, on them by a coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of what we've dealt with in, say, the, the 1990s, uh, you know, it it was a pretty toxic, tense locker room during those days. Yes. And I Danny think, wanted it that way. Yeah. And, you know, I think there were good hu- human beings that felt the need to be jerks just because that's sort of what had been set up from the top down. Um, and once the, their career is done, I think they look back on it and, you know, we look back on it and have different perspectives on, you know, every, there's more context, I guess, to what, what was going around, going on around them and the pressures that were being felt from, from a coaching staff. And the Randalls are the prime examples of that. You had Randall McDaniel, who's a great human being and yep. a, great guy to talk to, uh, does a lot of work in the community, and, and one of the great football players of all time. And during his career, he didn't talk to the media, and he kind of had this chip on it. He was yes. kind of surly. He, that's not who he is. And you know now you see that. Uh, John Randall, I got along great with John Randall. I'd call him in the offseason when he first came into the league. 
And then I went and covered baseball for a while. I came back and John was a star and he hated everybody, yeah. you know? And now, once again, now his career's over, he's healthy, and he's one of the nicest people we ever talked to. Yeah, and, you know, there, there were so many elements in that locker room where even if you were talking to a guy who was willing to talk, there always felt like somebody over your shoulder making sure, the you know, the – Denny came into town and said he was the new sheriff in mm-hmm. town, and it was like he had deputies all throughout that yep. locker room kind of keeping track on who's talking to who and what are they saying yep. and that sort of thing. And it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a friendly locker room. And you mentioned the two prime examples. I mean, Randall McDaniel, when, when, I was, you know, when he was in the locker room and, and I was in the locker room, you know, I felt like kind of a jerk, yeah. you know? And now I'm, the, you know, just the nicest guy around. Just a complete turnaround. Not, I'm sure he was a really nice guy back then, but he just felt the pressure of, you know, trying to deal with things how Denny wanted him, wanted him dealt with, and and matching that with his personality. And I think his solution was. I'm just not going to talk to anybody. Yeah, I think with Rand, and I covered Randall when he played for Jerry Burns, and even, so even before Denny got to town, he really just didn't talk, and you know, he, and it was never like I'm not saying he was overtly a jerk or anything. Right. He just didn't talk, and you, you just didn't feel comfortable around him. And that's like, again, like not who he is as a human being. Uh, the other interesting note about the Harvin uh, story was he explained his explosion. Uh, when they didn't hit the big play against Seattle. Yeah, and so uh, you know he, he was talking about uh, his sideline outburst with uh, with with Leslie Frazier, and he said it was a wheel route up the sideline. We had uh, worked on it all week with uh, with Ponder. If we get the right defense, this has to be our home run. When Ponder overthrew a wide open Harvin, quote, I came off the field like, nah, man, we got to have this. I ain't accepting that, coach. Um, I found it really interesting. Uh, you know, there there clearly was a lot of frustration with Harvin um, and Ponder. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when Ponder would miss him, it you know just didn't go well with Harvin. And even when you know Harvin would be open and he didn't see him, uh, you know, there were a lot of missed reads there. And and the one thing I found really interesting from this article was when when Harvin was talking about that. Um, and talking about just things in general, dealing with pressures of football, he said, I'm a perfectionist, and the perfectionist part of it drove me insanely crazy. I mean, you have a perfectionist with a quarterback like Christian Ponder. Highly imperfect. <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't get much more tense than that. And right. so you can see why things uh, went poorly. And, you know, one of, the, one of the conversations I remember having with Harvin in the locker room he was actually really impressed with with Ponder and how he worked and how he studied and all that. But I think once he got to games, you know, the you know, if you remember when when the Vikings drafted Ponder, they talked about how smart he was, yep. this double major, this guy in finance and economics and all that. That wasn't the guy that you saw on the field, though. You didn't no. see a smart player. You saw a panicky a player. player. Yep. Yes. And so I think that whole part went out, went out the door, you know, even though Harvin talked about, you know, how much Ponder studied and, and really worked hard on, on the mental part of the game. You know, once he had a pass rusher coming at him, yep. it was panic time. And, and that's what makes sport and football in particular so fascinating. Percy Harvin and Randy Moss might not have ever gone into a classroom. You know, I mean, we don't know. We <laughs> yeah. don't know that they ever went to a class. Right. Uh, and they're two incredibly smart football players. Yeah. And Christian Ponder, like I said, double major, you know, could have done anything he wanted it academically, and he was not a smart football player. And that's what makes scouting, yeah. I think it's got to make it so frustrating, is, you know, you can spend all these months looking at a player uh, or talking to a player in a classroom, talking to coaches and teammates and all of that, and ultimately you're just kind of hoping what you get is what you saw or heard about. And sometimes that doesn't come out to be the truth. I mean, and part of that has to do with um, not only the scheme they're in, so you have to sort of project how they would mm-hmm. be in that scheme, but the people they're around, they're, you know, in, in Harvin's case, maybe the quarterback that they played with. Yep. Um, just so many different things. Um, and that's why the, you know, the scouting aspect is so imperfect and can be so frustrating, not only for scouts and GMs, but for fans who, 
you know, say, hey, we're, we missed on this guy and that guy. Well, you also, you know, you hit on a Stefan Diggs in the fifth round, or you, right. you know, you found Adam Thielen, who was undrafted, and were able to develop him. So there are all all sorts of nuances that figure into the success or failure of an athlete. Absolutely. Uh, what's going on with autograph sessions right now? Here, here's one that I thought was really strange. So a lot of, you know, a lot of players, especially younger players, will get involved with uh, with autograph signings. So I saw one that Mike Hughes is doing, um, and it caught my attention because it, it said, uh, you know, he will only sign three-word inscriptions. Which I had never heard before, so I started like, looking. Go at, away now! Yeah, you know, yeah. I I started looking at uh, at this promotion a little bit more, and it says per Mike's exclusive agreement with Total Sports Enterprise, he will only sign three words. So he must have some sort of deal that precludes him from doing basically a regular autograph right. session, where you'd say, you know. Hey Jim, love your coverage or hate your coverage or whatever, and and sign it. No, now it's just like, thanks Jim, you know something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Bleep so, you, Jim. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Well, see that that would fit in three exactly. words. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's that's strange, but that's I mean I I, I don't really have a, a reaction to it. It's just weird. I mean, yeah. Uh, actually, I, I feel like my impression is that autograph signings have gone down from what they were maybe 15, 20 years ago. It seemed like a lot more players were doing them back then. Maybe it's the money now. Um, you know, I remember when Kevin Williams came in, um, there was a local, uh, you know, memorabilia store that wanted him to do autograph signing. And, and I, you know, I think it was a few hundred bucks that he did it for. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's almost always, you know, the, the stores have to talk to the agents. The agents are going to pull yep. out these really big deals. And most of the stores can't afford that. Right. I mean, or at least don't think they can afford it or that it would be worth it. So um, I, I don't see as many of the autograph signings going on as I used to 15, 20 years ago. And what's going on with the Kirk Cousins football camp? Well, this is one that I thought was kind of interesting because there are so many players that, that have these football camps that, you know, it just, to me it would seem like one is basically like another, um, you know, it, it, the main thing is, can I get my kids to it? You know, is it right. local enough to get my kids to it? Well, Cousins Camp sounds like it's less about football and more about life and faith and having fun and all these other things. You know, I found it interesting that, you know, he had uh, Bible verses that he gave to the kids to memorize, and if they were able to memorize them back, they got additional points for their relay team and all this stuff. But he's also doing um, thing, you know, things like uh, dodgeball um, or I think it's called knockerball. You've seen these things where they're big inflatables uh, where people are running around bumping into yes. each other. Although you just gave me a Jerry Burns flashback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the big knockers. The big, the big, the big knockers. He's, <laughs> yeah. a, he's a big knockers. Yeah. Well, that was more fun, I think, than probably watching Knockerball. I mean, it's interesting watching it. But, um, you know, I I kind of like what Cousins is doing here because I think in, in today's youth athletics, there is so much pressure on the kids. Uh, the coaches want them often to just specialize in one sport, to spend 12 months doing exercises that – deal with that one sport and we've seen time and time again people coming back at that saying no it's best if you're you know involved in multiple sports and i don't see as many kids having fun with the sports and so i like what cousins is doing where you know yes we're going to go through some football drills but we're going to have some fun we're going to play dodgeball we're going to you know play capture the flag and knocker ball and all this other stuff so um, it's a, it sounds like it's a camp that's really growing in popularity and, uh, I like what he's doing, trying to make it more fun than about just football. Tim's going to give us a final thought. Uh, thanks again to everybody who listens. Thanks to Twill in the Dining Galleria. That's right off France Avenue, uh, in a really nice mall. Uh, thanks to Tony Hoagland, H-O-A-G-L-U-N-D, your State Farm agent in Champlin. If you'd like to advertise with us, J-S-O-U-H-A-N-4-7 at gmail.com. Uh, and get in quick because I think we're going to have a very full slate for the fall. Uh, come out to the, the live shows tonight, 
July 3rd at Delano's Pizza, 5.30 for the Russo Show, July 17th, 6 o'clock at Freehouse for the Cheryl Reeves Show. Uh, 